Welcome, um, everybody, back to uh, Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Center at the Graduate Center in CUNY. It's uh, our last week um, in this um, incredible year of 2020 where we are hosting um, um, these talks. It's, of course, a very emotional um, year There's, uh, also for us, so for being so close to the to the new year as we hope that 2021 will be a different one. So this is an important uh, a week for us. We started out the talks in March. Uh, I think it was Taylor Mack, Kirsten Martin from here, Thomas Ostermeyer from the Schaubühne Berlin and others. And, um, and this year we are um, closing it out. We had Bonnie Maranka from the PAJ magazine of uh, the Journal of Performance and Art. Today is with us the Al Limite company that comes out of the living theater tradition and tomorrow we have the great Nurikin Poetry Cafe. Uh, we have spoken words artists with us and um, it's been uh, quite a ride this year. We spoke to over um, I think 150, 200 artists in 150 sessions from 50, 60 countries around the world. Most probably this is the only archive of a profession um, that archived the moment of Corona across the globe. Um, we didn't know when we started this out and we also didn't know that it would take so long that how big the dimensions would be, but we had a feeling in the beginning that this is important. And we hear so much from politicians, virologists, uh, economists and others, but we here at the Siegel has always felt we need to hear from the artists, um, from uh, theater and workers from theater. Uh, practitioners and uh, to get their insights, how they create meaning um, for themselves in these unprecedented times where really, really reality is a stranger than fiction. Artists have been close to the right side of justice, the right side of progress, as we think, in this complex struggle for freedom and liberty. And, and what they have to say is of significance, and perhaps we should have listened to that earlier, or oh, many, many place dealing with all the complications we are dealing with now, also the ecological disaster, political disasters. And, um, and we want to just also take this moment to thank uh, HowlRound uh, for, for hosting us. It's been a very big uh, commitment. And we have Vijay with us here. He is uh, one of the producers and one of the, one of the, um, the makers uh, that makes HowlRound what it is, this beloved, I would say, online and, um, streaming service that also was created in a time uh, uh, that perhaps foreshadowed the significance that um, the digital space, the, uh, the screens, the uh, um, uh, Skype, and now of course Zoom will take over. The first time I used Zoom in my life was when I had my first uh, uh, Siegel talk in March and I think how long put something together. So Vijay, how has it been for you this year of, uh, of uh, uh, producing online for the theater? Yeah, it's, it's been very, very busy and We've been so honored to have um, organizations like yours and many, many other organizations um, kind of using our online platform, our support um, and this kind of peer produced infrastructure to have these kinds of connections and conversations and learning from each other. So that's been really, really rewarding for us um, to help that kind of thing. And um, and really necessary thing in this moment. Um, and I feel that, you know, this kind of, these kinds of connections that we're able to make, especially now since pandemic, um, you know, the ability for us, especially in the global North to be connecting with artists in the global South, it's, um, we've done that more during the pandemic than ever before. So that's one of the kind of like, um, you know, hidden kind of good things that have come out of all of this. And so I really hope these new behaviors and connections continue on into the future. Yeah, no, really, really thank you. I think this is an enormous contribution. I think Carol Martin in TDR, the great TDR theater and drama and review, um, you know, she also interviewed you and showcased how well in a way is a new model of producing. So in a way, this also is a paras theatrical event. We talk, people perform themselves, they talk about their work, uh, they, you know, their lives and it's kind of a new form, a hybrid form that came uh, out of it. And I think the production model that um, HowlRound uh, created for readings to decentralize it away from the big metropolitan cities, from the metropolitan supremacy also in a way, you know, that it's a democratic access to the arts and people can participate 
uh, around America, but now also around the world, I think is a, is a great thing. So really, really wanted to say um, thank you. And it's wonderful um, to have you with us. Normally we have Thea, um, who is already um, um, uh, visiting her family in, in the Bay Area. So we want to say thank you to her again. Um, actually, we should write her an email now and say, where are you? We can start uh, <laughs> or something. But um, let's come to our our guests today. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a significant, um, uh, I think, uh, a company with us, um, a company that um, came out, you know, sprung out of the earth of a, of, of a um, legendary um, uh, couple of, that created theater, of uh, the living theater of uh, originally from J Judas Molina, Julian Back, then Hammond, um, uh, Resnikov F, and, um, and this is a, a company that formed, if I understand right, also somehow in this time um, of Corona, who's keeping on a tradition. So it stands for many companies, many, perhaps across the US, we do not know about, um, who formed, who are thinking about um, how to continue work, uh, who are struggling and who are trying to create meaning for us, for audiences, but also for themselves. They choose uh, to work in theater as a way of life, a way of living. I think Bonnie Maranka, who was with us yesterday, has pointed out that perhaps artists, in a way, are the last three members of this society. This We live in this hyper-capitalistic uh, uh, world uh, where everything is a commodity and, uh, and it is so much about the commercial value of what we do that artists perhaps um, are the ones who do it, but it's uh, so hard to do. It's hard to be an artist. It's hard to do theater anywhere in the world, but it is especially um, hard here um, in New York City. Um, the great, we, of course, we would have loved to have the great, great Judith Malina with us. She had been at the Siegel Center for many, many evenings as a participant, um, whether she was acting in Frank O'Hara plays, talking about her Piscato notebooks, or part participating in discussions on theater and history and politics and uh, poetry. She had her moon poems often at, at our place, but she also came in her last years when she was in the old age home. She would drive in from New Jersey um, to the Siegel Center and listen to our events and participate, engaging in our uh, discussions. And she was really upset with me that I didn't create a Siegel bar or a Siegel cafe. She said, there's no place where I can go in New York in the old days, there was a bar where we go, where we hang out. There's nowhere I can go and meet someone who I know or where I feel at home. And um, I always think about that. And a little bit, it was always the idea of the Siegel to create a community. And maybe one day we have to create the Julius Molina Bar. Um, and everybody who is here has been working with her and inspired by her work. So with us is the Alimita a, a company. And... Um, and we're going to hear from them a little bit how, how, how it is to create a theater or think about theater in the time of Corona here in New York City, how to create a new company. And um, so we have uh, with us uh, Jessica Doherty um, from, the, uh, from the company, uh, Dennis, uh, who is Nui Lee and uh, who is the, directing a lot of the work, uh, Shadow Games Molina and the great Soraya. Brookim, who also directed uh, at the Siegel Center and part of Japanese Playwrights Project. So Dennis has worked with us. So it's um, a company we are close to. We had Tom Walker with us here on the Siegel. He gave one of, I think, the most really interesting and important conversations, maybe might be for anybody who's interested, also inspiration to go back, what he had to say. He has been with the living since 1972. And this is kind of a variation, an update, a modulation, a new form um, of, 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 of a, a theater tradition that has been so significant. Um, we had uh, Hilary Miller, he, she, who said so many ideas out of the 50s who were done in living rooms in the underground became so big and important in the 60s. And the 60s still have an, uh, such an uh, impact that, uh, as we said yesterday, also people think, why do we talk still about the 60s and the 70s? But we talk about it because it was important. So this is very close to that, but it's also trying to, to reinvent, to recreate. Uh, as uh, Heiner Müller, the great German playwright and director said about Bertolt Brecht, if you use Brecht without criticizing him, it's treason, you should get go to jail. So you have to find new ways um, of, um, of, of doing things. And it is our you know, guiding motto in a way you know, that Brecht said, new times 
meet new forms of theater and definitely we live, live in different times and in new times. So welcome uh, 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 here to the Siegel Talks. It always say it's about listening, very right? listening, and then I go on and on and talk, so I hope you will forgive me. So um, uh, Jessica, Dennis, Shadow, Soraya, welcome everybody here. And uh, so where are you? And um, let's begin with uh, Jessica and tell us a little bit about yourself and your work, what you're doing in the... Sure. Thank you for having us. Thank you to the Siegel Center and HowlRound. Um, we've collaborated with you over the course of this year. And it was really nice to feel like we had a home, even in this ephemeral sort of liminal world that we live in. So thanks to all of you. I'm Jessica. I, right now I live um, on Cowlitz and Clackamas land in the Northwest, also known as Portland, Oregon with my partner, Brad Hamers, who's also a member of the collective. Right now, it's about 9-11 in the morning. And um, I came to the theater out of a documentary film perspective, but I also am a performer. So I started, I met Judith in 2014 when they were doing um, the outdoor theater piece, No Place to Hide. And that's how I met all these amazing people that are here with us today and the rest of the collective that the people that would become Alimite. So um, I'm very grateful that we, we found each other and uh, all believe in the need for human connection and how art can facilitate that. I think a lot of us look at as, ourselves as facilitators, not just actors, directors, or writers, uh, conduits, for human growth and so it was it was a challenge during at the beginning of this year we really launched the collective and um, as participatory theater practitioners uh, now we can't touch people yeah it's such we, a such a different world out here and uh, and, and and everything yeah we can't changed. really have yeah. eye contact either yeah. so yeah. so it's let me let me ask Dennis because before we come to the founding of the company, Dennis, uh, wh where are you at the moment? And tell us a little bit about you and your work and how you came. To yeah, um, I'm currently in Queens. Uh, that's where I'm based. And uh, originally, I'm from Taiwan. I joined the Living Theater in 2012. Uh, at the same time, going after my own passion, which is directing and writing plays that I think uh, resonates with something uh, that I care the most. And after, after a while, I took care of Judith all the way until she passed away. And later on, we, we, we decided to start this company, Our Limited Together, to continue the legacy in a somewhat different format. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. even if with my work, it's, it's still similar to you know, what we do, what we have been doing with the living theater, what we are doing with Our Limited. Mm -hmm. Soraya, tell us a bit about you and, and, and your work and how, how do you fit in this, in this uh, puzzle? I'm um, currently in Manhattan where I was born and raised and actually the room where I was born and raised. <laughs> like you were born? born, born? <laughs> well, I mean, like I came here since I was yes. little, slept here mm -hmm. um, ever since. Uh, um, now it's full of stuff, <laughs> just storage. Um, I was, I was in Queens before, like Dennis, um, so I joined the Living Theatre in 2010. I, we started with uh, this play Korach, um, which according to Judith was the first um, anarchists uh, in the Torah, and uh, I've been part of it ever since and uh, joined these lovely people that I love so much, uh, each and every one of them for with Alimete. And I've been an actress since I was 14 years old, went into directing, uh, uh, encouraged, thank you, thanks to Franck. And uh, I write poetry and um, other things. I'm a healer, an Ayurvedic healer. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, I think that the name, the title of 
this company, Al Limite, which means limitless and no limits, um, says so much because Judith, I would tell Judith uh, when I would have conversations in her in her bedroom uh, on Clinton Street, she I would say I want to do so many things that are just variety, you know, science, art, everything. And she said, well, you can do it all. You're limitless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's just so amazing that this this is the name that we came up with. So you came up with, yeah, that's that's quite something. And she really meant that. She did not just say it. You, she she meant that. Yeah. Limitless. Shadow. Um, sorry, we have you uh, um, at the uh, in, at the end a bit, but um, tell us a bit about you and and your work. Um, Where are you? Um, currently, I'm in Las Vegas. I came back here at the beginning of December. I was in Brooklyn prior to that this year in hopes of actually fully launching a limited mm -hmm. life. Um, and then COVID happened. But um, I come from the dance background. I'm a movement, uh, movement is my, special, my specialty. I start collaborating. I call myself like a satellite member of Living Theater because I've always been in all my work with the Living Theater has always been in the West or in Mexico. Um, so I consider myself a satellite member. Um, I started with working with, with The Living in 2013 at Burning Man when they built a, a black box theater. And I was part of a different collective back then. I was based in San Francisco, which, which uh, we were doing Buto under Bad Uncle Sister. And from there, I just stay in the site of Al Limite. I joined them. Um, towards the end of their um, tour of Latin America last year doing uh, Electric Awakening. And ever since then, I just, I'm like one of those little animals that just like clang on to the core members of the, of the Living Theater. And when this opportunity comes to launch a new theater, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I've been blessed and fortunate to be surrounded by these amazing creatives. And I'm happy to be here today. And share this moment with yes. all of you. Thank you, guys. And you know, um, not most probably, I think it is. We can say that since World War II, it hasn't been so difficult for theater artists. It was tough times in the fifties, tough times in the sixties, also in the seventies when New York City got broke. But I guess the, it depends what kind of theater artist you are. Yeah, it's true. But it was a tough time to to make a living, to work, to form a com company. Right now, in this time. Um, so tell us a bit, is that, is the moment of the 2020 uh, year, um, is that, is that connected to your, to, to the formation of the company? Is it putting an imprint on you guys that would not have happened if it would be a normal complicated year? I would say first thing um, the COVID has taken away from us is the space, the physical space it really pushes us into thinking what are the possible alternatives for a theater company to survive and push us into thinking how we can embrace the technology world. Because theater has a tradition of, you know, forget about what technology has advanced. Uh, we still have our space, we still have our audience members, but this is the moment that, well, those things are non-existent. How do we embrace Zoom, for instance? How do we utilize all those platforms? for instance. And when we started this company, it wasn't really necessary in our conversation, but when we sat down all together, it became part of something integral to our conversation that we can never not talk about it. That's the first thing that we definitely, you know, share and discuss the most. Je Jessica, you mentioned earlier, you know, that time of COVID and the creation of the company. I mean, you, in a big way, you were even if you think about it before, but you, you, you guys got together this year. What does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, if we wanted to continue the, the move to connect people to, to make participatory theater, we had to become digital, right? So we had to embrace the social media where everyone hangs out. We had to learn how to communicate on Zoom, which we're still trying to perfect. Um, you know, we ended up, you know, doing weekly Zoom calls that anyone could jump in on just to make sure that we still felt connected to each other. Um, and so we had to kind of grow a third arm 
in that way. Um, Cause we just relied so much on being with each other. Uh, Brad and I had planned to come for a retreat sort of, you know, workshop to be together, um, develop new projects. And then it turned out that we couldn't come to New York because of the travel restrictions, the 14 day required quarantine and things. So even though, you know, we, we still want to be together, we tried and, and we couldn't. So it's sort of, a, it's, a, it's a test in perseverance you know, al limite also meaning like you're at the limit. And when we perform live together, a lot of the, I think, real transformative moments happen when we're exhausted, when we've been performing for an hour, two hours at full speed and we get really tired. That's when the real transcendent um, understanding comes out. And I, I like to think that this is just another one of those tests. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and as we go into 2021, it's not like magically it's going to go away. So we're practicing our endurance together. And I'm really looking forward to what comes out of that exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So Soraya, you, you talked a little bit about the spirit of the company, but what is the, what's the vision? What's the mission? What, what, what do you guys want to do? I think that um, I want to say that there was an exhibition that I saw on Gertrude Stein and she said that, you know, she was a collector and she said, collect the art that is now, that is of the time. And I think that this company really represents of this time of right now. And I want to mention like there's Cyprus and Monica and Leia and Philip who are also part of this company. Um, did I miss anybody else? No, that's everyone, right? Yeah. And Brad. And Brad. Always Brad. Yes. Um, and uh, everyone has, uh, a, you know, there's no hierarchy, I feel, in this company. It's like the first time that we all individuals have something to give and to offer. Um, and we don't just offer one thing, we offer m multiple things. Um, everyone has a different skill and strength uh, that makes unity and, and in that there's strength in this, in this unity. Um, I think it was really beautiful about the, 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 you know, it's more about, instead of being a vision, it's more about the feeling of the company is that um, we really acknowledge each other where we are at that time. So what did you guys do this year? Like, let's say what, what kind of performances or say what, what happened this year? Um, this is basically the year you yeah. started out. What, what did you do? So Jessica um, mentioned that every week we would meet up and actually every week whenever there was a, a talk or a conversation, we always brought something into fruition. And so one of the projects that everyone was part of all over the world, actually, not just us. So the, the branch, the lens of the company goes out to the whole world of whoever we've ever touched um, and whoever can participate. Uh, um, we we, t we asked everybody that was ever been part of us um, to write, uh, to express how they feel during COVID as a beginning, middle and ending. And uh, everyone wrote and responded to that. And out of that, um, each person would, uh, we'd start with the beginning and then the middle and then the ending. And we would do a response, a video response, a digital response, because that's all we really had. Um, to any in any how with the audio or visual or, 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 or painting or anything um and we would respond to that write to those writings that poem that you would choose and then create something from that uh digitally um and then we would post it uh on youtube on uh instagram and that's was one of the biggest things but there were other things that were created that we can talk about as well right if you look up uh hashtag all Limite Liminal Archive, you can see all of the entries from people from Brazil, uh, Mexico, uh, and the US and other places around the world. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's quite something. Um, and and um, let's talk a little bit about the idea of the legacy. I, I under, if I understood right, you're also out on the street. So there's a pipeline in Brooklyn uh, where you did, you, you did something. So um, you're carrying on a tradition in a way that you know a path that was you know 
uh, created before by, by, by the living. So uh, tell us a little bit, what is your idea, what's the idea behind, tell us about this project, but also as a forming, um, founding ideas, what, what is that about what you're doing? So I think, you know, the, the online project that we did was actually inspired by uh, when, we, when we were still spending time with Judith, we always uh, rec uh, embraced the moment that we were together, such as like Passover. And this, this particular year, we actually did the Passover. We had the, the scripture that was written, adapted by Judith Bellina, and we were reading it via Zoom. We realized that we could create something that's ritualistic, which is always the legacy of the living theater, something that's super ritualistic, that breaks the, the quotidian life that put people into a liminal space so that you know eventually at the end of the production, you feel invigorated, you, 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 you gain a new energy of some sort. That was the beginning of that project. So we were trying really experimenting on how do we incorporate the Instagram, the micro art, the mini scale art, so to speak. And uh, for the Brooklyn, the pipeline project, it was really, uh, you know, Judith, when we were still in a living theater, oftentimes we went on the street to just join the protest, to really stand with the people that are oftentimes or, uh, underheard, underrepresented. And uh, Monica, one of our members, she has been highly involved in activist movement, uh, especially against climate change, against all those pollution, polluting companies. And when we knew this uh, pipeline issue, we instantly jumped right in and say, you know what, it, even it's COVID-19, this issue is affecting everybody. It's Tell us, what is the issue? I also wasn't aware of it. What's, what's the pipeline? So it was actually a, a, a fracking gas pipeline that's going through the northern part of Brooklyn. And the, the gas pipeline does not benefit the Brooklyn residents. Instead, that pipeline just went through, goes through the Brooklyn and then transporting the gas into, I believe it's Long Island. And when National Grid was doing this project, they didn't, they didn't host any town hall meeting. They didn't talk to the local residents. And we residents started to feel like, oh, maybe it was just uh, the fixing of the repairing of the water pipeline. We didn't pay too much attention to it until when they went into the last phase of the construction, we realized that it was actually fracking gas and it's polluting the area. And the, 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 the bill went high if you are national grid users. Nobody knows anything. And we decided to no, let's collaborate with the local residents and then really try to come out to stop the construction of the pipeline. The fight is still continuing. Yeah. And what's evil about it is that the, the pipeline runs through all the black and brown communities of Brooklyn. Um, that's what's harsh about it. And People are being faced now with the $184 million price tag of building that pipeline. As Dennis said, does it benefit Brooklyn? Does it benefit New York? It mm -hmm. goes to the highest bidder um, of that frack, frack gas. And if New York State passed no fracking, but yet they're, they're releasing frack gas, meaning they, they, um, so, um, they transform the liquid gas into air gas so they can easily um, compress it and easily transport it. Mm. Um, and uh, Josh Fox did that documentary Gasland, right? That really clearly shows the environmental impact and um, that has. So yeah, so you, you continue mm -hmm. using form of theater to raise awareness of, of, of um, you know, what, what is and, gas. And the irony of it is that it also runs through all the green spaces in those neighborhoods. That's what's Mind blowing about it. Not only the green spaces, the schools, the, the churches, everything that where people gathered, it seems like it's almost targeted by it, you know? And that's what's really, really like almost incomprehensible why we're even doing this, you know? Right. Yeah. Don't the companies call these areas that they plan to go through sacrifice zones or something? So yeah. the name of the project is, or some of the language is Brooklyn is not a sacrifice zone, you know, don't come through here. And I think, Shadow, you filmed a, uh, one of the performances that were done, right? On a moving, uh, I remember it was a moving cart that was- Oh yeah, that it's, it's a bit different. That uh, we also oh. have a mobile unit that 
uh, Monica had brought up to the to the collective. Um, it's a platform that's attached to four pipes, and we've used that to promote the pipeline as well to the, against the pipeline. And also, we also use that for more, um, anti ice uh, performances. Um, after the pipeline was done, we actually took it apart and took it to um, the Brooklyn Detention Center and performed in front of the of the detention center. And that's why you also did performances um, in the as well. detention centers and really it's quite quite remarkable. I would not have known about that pipeline actually. I've never seen any article about it. And the funny thing is like nobody knew about it. People that live underneath the pipeline did not know about it until we start performing and start putting all those yeah. um, banners and, <clears throat> and flyers. When, when we talk about um, um, theater and new forms, you know, of course, there is the famous saying, um, Beckett also used to, there's nothing new under the sun, and it's true. But there's also reuse, reinvention of things. We had here um, Annie Hamburger, you know, who um, did uh, such uh, fantastic productions outside with on guard arts. She was a pioneer uh, in that work, not only with Reza Abdu, but also much, much before. Uh, we have Bertie Ferdinand, who talked about the offsides. Um, you know, how can we use spaces? Well, by, that we should use spaces with COVID or without. We have to, you know, find different ways, be outside the walls of the theater. So the Living Theater has done that in a long time. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the work you did already with Judas on the streets. How would you organize that? How does it work? Because you don't, as we now know, we don't, you don't need, you know, the theater to do something. You can sort of all theater people in New York. Now say, who have theater? Oh, we can't do anything, our buildings are closed. You, you guys never had a building, these two theaters. But tell us a bit, what, what did you learn? How does it work? How do you use streets? How do you use public places as, um, as theater stages? Well, it was used so many times, but one of the, one of the particular uh, moments that struck me was that when we took seven meditations uh, on sadomasochism uh, out, uh, which was a play that was done in 1970, um, which was a uh, to voice out uh, all of the punishments and torture that were being done in Brazil. I think it was in 1973. Uh, and Judith and Julian and the collective, they, uh, the company wrote this piece and then we brought it back. I think this was in 2011. Uh, when we brought it back at uh, no, 2010, when we brought it back at first, and then uh, we brought it back to Washington Square Park and to uh, Union Square. And the way it worked was is that we already had a piece that was created, and uh, we, when we were on Washington Square Park, we just all came together and uh, we set it like a stage. Uh, we were in place and we started, and we just did it. And people would just watch and participate and because at the end of seven meditations we uh, approach the people and say you know what can we do to change and what what in your uh, vision can we do to change and we would have a discussion with each individual uh privately at the end of the show so and how does it work do you ask for a permission uh, how do you define the <laughs> permission. So how do you just say hey we're going to be there you send out an email <laughs> or you send out instagram or Tell us a bit how it works. It's a very interesting uh, one thing. Well, we what, during the living theater time, we definitely like when there, whenever there's people, wherever there's people, we go there. We we want to carry out the message. We want to convince, express the message to the people. So whenever there's people, we all, we're, we're always there. Washington Square or High Line. And funny quick story is when we were doing no place to do uh, no place to hide outdoor. We performed at High Line. We didn't realize that it was a private park, which means you have to ask for permission to perform. We simply just show up. We said it's a public space. Everybody can come here to see things. And the performance gathered about 100 or so people up to the point that they have to send security guards to kick us out. At the time, Judith was with us and Leah was the director. She came up to the, the, the policemen, the, the cops, and said, what's the matter? What's the problem? It's a public space. We were, we were entitled to do things. We're the public, we're the, we're the citizens right here. What's the <clears> matter? <throat> they said, you have to shut it down because you don't have permit. And she simply said, well, shut out yourself. There's a hundred people, you can talk to them. 
if you if they're willing to cooperate, you can shut it down. Otherwise, we're going to be done in 10 minutes. You can let us finish and we're going to leave. It's your call. So what they did is they let us finish. Mm -hmm. And we came back the next day, still without a permit. <laughs> So in Washington Square Park, also you you just you, you put like this chalk or you how do you define no, no, no. the there's, space where you go? How does it work? Or how did it tell us a little bit? There's it's also, almost sorry, it's almost like pretty magical in some sense. Like we, I find it that audience are willing to engage into something like what's happening there. You know, like find find example. We were rehearsing the Brooklyn piece in Greenpoint, and it's pretty almost like there's nobody around there. It's almost isolated. All you have there at Greenpoint was all the trucks and all the workers. But the workers were engaged to a point where like, what are you guys doing? To a point where like they were standing there and watching, even though they work for National Grid, they end up watching us. And because the, the curiosity brings the audience. In that sense to me, like our street theater, you just bring it to the street and people just gravitate to it because people are wanting it. People want to see stuff. People want to be engaged. And I think that's the beauty of like, to performance, like license or no license, like bring it to the street and people will gravitate to it. Right, we wanna diffuse the, the perceived separation between theater performance and life. There's no fourth wall. Mm -hmm. We are in space and we perform as individuals um, with a common idea. And if the people in Tompkins Square Park key into that idea, they actually become part of the performance with us. So you have a set, a set mo a monologue or you have speeches recorded, you have some kind of a costume, you say we're going to do that tomorrow at 2 p.m., you send out an Instagram or an email and, and then you, uh, you just you perform and you find your audience. Like a hundred people is what people are always very happy if they have so many in a small theater, right? Yeah, but usually we meet up beforehand um, because you know we also run uh, daily workshops where we teach people how to do this. Um, uh, and uh, a, a day in the life of the living was called originally. Um, and when we created a piece in at, around flat iron, uh, that was uh, an, uh, the last time we I think I, we taught once. That wasn't the last time, but um, we create a piece. There's a structure. You have to know where you are. There's a discipline. There is like any performance. There's warm up. There's a consensus, and then we walk out there together, and then we uh, take we take a space that we chose and we start. That's usually how it is. We have to we usually meet up before. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention also you asked about location. There's another aspect to some of this work, and that's uh, I guess you would consider it direct action. Um, and <clears throat> that means, you know, taking for us, that means taking a theater piece that we've devised with the message to a specific location or a specific group of people who we wanna share that message with. So let's say we, in the 2016 Know Your Rights tour, we wanted to send some messages to Boeing, to Monsanto, um, and a, a couple of other organizations that are actively damaging our environment and communities. We didn't want to let them know that we were coming. We didn't want to ask their permission to come and send this message to them or perform for them. So that's another aspect of this as well. Um, anyone can get together with a group of people with a common problem in mind and come up with something to say about it and go and take action. Sort of like that, that I was talking about. You went in front of the Boeing headquarters or what did you do? Yes, uh, we, on that tour, we traveled to Chicago where the head, there's a big headquarters there and we performed right in front of the front door, um, causing uh, the security folks to be alerted, um, maybe causing some of the very busy workers in, in Chicago to at least turn their heads to see what we were talking about. Um, and uh, we also went to Berkeley and a couple of other places and performed seven meditations and after that, we brought the audience out into the streets because that's what Julian and, and in Paradise Now, the theater is in the streets. Mm. So we continue. But in a way, to you're using techniques that were developed in the 60s, 50s, 60s, or Boal's work and others, and you're adapting them to the 21st century. 
do that, does it work? And what is new about it? What's different? I think something that we are still doing, uh, it's not necessarily new, new per se, is we, we are just getting accustomed to what is happening nowadays, which is there's a lot of technology. So even something that's as old as, you know, in the 60s, when you go on the street to do highly stylized biomechanical movements, it attracts people's attention because people nowadays are not used to it. So when you have a group of people really committed into doing a certain specific thing, it instantly draws attention. So we, we just remind people that there is this tool that's still timeless. But just because we are moving into a technological world doesn't mean the old tool is no longer working. And that, that is also the way that we do street theater, which is always prepare ourselves. So no matter what happened on the street, you stay with your own message. You know you have to trust your ensemble members that they are always going to back you up. So when we were doing state of direct action, we need to, we need to talk about what's gonna happen if the cops show up. Who is gonna be in charge of de-escalating de any tension? And how do we safely leave out the space? But also at the same time, when we enter the public space, how do we come in with a very strong determined uh, attention towards the place that we are performing so that people can instantly tell that it's a space that's going to make something happen, so to speak. It's a very similar way as you, if you go to Washington Square, you will see people that the break dancers, they are trying to like call out people and say like, hey, we're gonna have a show, we're gonna have a show. Sometimes we do we do, do that, but sometimes all, all that's needed is just a group of people in costume coming to the space with the commitment and do the show. Instantly people will, draw, will be drawn without much ado. Fine example is that when we take the mobile unit, uh, it's just me, Monica, and Leia, three of us driving that thing. And there's Leia in the middle of the platform in somewhat like a, like a chicken wire cage for the anti-ice anti -ice, um, performance. And we literally stopped traffic like to a point where like people were honking because people, are, people in the cars were engaged. Um, that was not an idea. My idea to take the, uh, the, the, the platform to another space and then around there was like a, a hard bike ride up. So like we caused traffic and because like the, the, the car that was next to us was following us. We're full, I would list the, the migrants um, so they can attach to the, the message of what we're, what we're performing. And, and as Danny said, like we can engage audience without even asking them to be engaged. You know, seeing someone in costume in the middle of Brooklyn on a bike, on a platform, attach a four bikes. I was like, I wanna see that. What are they doing? You know, curiosity spikes that. And um, I think we're fortunate enough to like, we have so many creative minds in our collective that, you know, can come in and out and put something on a table where something this, this simple yet amazing can be executed and, you know, grab the, the minds of audience whether they want it or not. <laughs> There was a, we all, we all performed as a collective in, uh, in Mexico and uh, it was the day of the Women's March and as Shadow says, it's like really magical. And we were just walking and walking and walking and walking and we created this piece called the Electric Awakening and we took parts of Electric, Electric Awakening, which was a story of going from death to birth. And um, at that magic moment, right before all these, uh, people were about to start the march, we just started this, we started the Electric Awakening uh, and a uh, part of it and everyone just stopped. And it was, it, it, there were so many people, it was so ma incredibly magical. Everyone just paid attention and stopped and watched us and let us do the performance. And then we dispersed and then they started marching. Um, there was also a moment in, I wasn't there, but uh, I remember Leia telling me the story that there was a moment in, um, it was a Mormon uh, uh, area, uh, right? Uh, and um, 
we're, there's this performance in Salt Lake City, right in Salt Lake City, and there's this performance that we, where we meet each other very slowly. Um, it's a moment of love where we touch with we make love without touching, and it was same sex uh, uh, love making and. Uh, did it right in the middle of that, right? There was like a... The reflection pool, which represents the union between a man and a woman only. And we went beyond that. <laughs> right, of course. we got kicked out. <laughs> That's what we went to do. I think uh, one thing you, you might be asking about... In, the, in the Mormon uh, uh, kind of uh, stronghold you know, in there, pool of, of unity, you know, like a couple of same sex would say, we should be, it should be the same rights for everyone. So you went in there, you put actually your bodies at risk. So you do it, Camus said, you create dangerous arts or as Pasolini said, you know, we have to throw our bodies into life. So you take a risk, right? When you, when you go out there. Absolutely. And it, as Dennis said, it, it takes a certain commitment to each other, a confidence. And I think that's something that Judith and Julian really cultivated. We work with something we call magic casting, which is a combination of trust in yourself and trust in the people that you're collaborating with and working with. Your awareness of the space. So you're aware of what's going on inside the performance, but you're also aware of who's watching and the environment and how it's changing as you perform so that you can bring it in or so that you can react appropriately. You know, if there's a bulldozer coming for you, for instance, or a police officer who's gonna to try to come break up the performance. There's, there's this awareness and this trust. And I think that every theater company or every performance group can develop this together. Um, and it just takes some, some trust. Yeah, the other thing tech, like if we're talking about techniques, I remember the a small anecdote that some, uh, one of the members in the Living Theater asked about Judith, how to get into the character uh, that she's portraying. And the respondent was, it was, it, there was not, nothing that's called character. It was all about yourself performing in the spot. So whenever you are perform, whenever you are performing, you always keep it to yourself. You know you are there. You are present. It's not a character that's present. It's you that's present. So even picking back to what Jessica just said, uh, the trust is you need to believe into the message that you are trying to convey. You need to believe why you are there. You need to convince yourself you are there for a, a, a good cause and you need to trust the people uh, around you. Same as when we did uh, a report in the Storias, when we did the reading, the talk that we had it was really not about how do you portray the minors or the minors' life. It's all about you at this particular day, election night. What do you believe that the future of America is going to be like? What do you think? How do you fathom by doing this project actually help advocate for the things that you believe, so to speak? So it's, it's, it's all about preparing yourself more than preparing yourself for acting out a character. So I would like to hear from you. Uh, what do you believe in? Why, why do you guys make theater and not painting or, or another art form? Why do you do theater? What does it do? And has COVID changed that a bit? So I would really like to hear from every one of you. Why, why are you doing this? I think that one of the things that are, is like transformational, radical transformation and like leadership that we all lead our own lives and we can all help each other. And I think one of the ways of actually finding the collective idea is first, of course, what, what do we need? Uh, what does our community need? And we ask our community uh, when we work with other people, what do you feel you need in the community right now, where you are, the country you are, the time you are and where you are, what do you need? And then from there with the tools that we have to perform, and to create art, we think about, okay, how can we change that? And what can we do to voice that? And from there, uh, art, art is created and we led. Yeah, it, it's, you, you don't, sometimes for me, I don't have to believe 
certain things. When I walk on the street, I look around. When I see people that are not having a house to live in, that are shivering in cold, uh, or the people that are waiting to get food, it's, it's already a good cause for us to continue doing what we do. Because it's, it's only human to really care about other human beings. And oftentimes, especially in big cities, it, it, sometimes you, get, you, you forget that you, you need to do certain things for the benefit of the human being itself. Yeah. Yeah, theater is um, the art form that represents to me action. And it was when, when I first was reading Judith, um, some of Judith's writing, it, it dawned on me, she talks about actors, but not in the, the sense of like Uta Hagen or you know, Stanislavski and Ethan Hawke, but actor as an activist, someone who can take action and change the environment that they're in with purpose. So it really changed what I, what I perceived as what theater is or what the, who the actor is inside of that and what the possibilities are as a human being, not just a, okay, I'm gonna become a performer now and perform this story or this character like Dennis talked about. So uh, I, I don't wanna lose that in our, in our for humanity, <laughs> we have to keep it exercising it. I look at um, a limiter and the formation of a limiter as my personal lifeline. Um, I moved to Brooklyn this, earlier this year in January in hopes of gathering together as a group to find, to create a repertoire because we had planned tours earlier this summer that you know was all canceled because of COVID. But then when COVID happened, then I realized that everything is destroyed. And then a quote that came up to me throughout this year is destruction is a prerequisite for creating identity. Um, by living through that the past year, and it was like, it gave me hope that, yeah, we might not be able to perform in life, but we can develop our own identity creatively. Um, and that, 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 kept me, that kept me alive, that hopes, that idea that, yeah, we might not be in the same space, but if we just keep pushing little by little, we will come off of it a better than when we came into it. Um, and that I think to me was my saving grace for my creative mentality. You know, and I was like, yeah, because as I said, for me, all my work has been participatory in contact with other people, you know, with my co-performers, with the audience, you know, uh, I've been in the past 10 years in my performance have been, how do we bring the audience into the performance? That's always been the main question. And now, we don't, now I don't have that outlet. I'm like, how can I bring the audience without touching them or without even looking at them? You know, or not, not, not even being in the same space, you know? Um, and I think that's what COVID brought up, to, brought up to us, you know? It's like, we don't have this, we're taking this, what you gonna do now, mm, yeah. Also a question of you, do you feel this time of COVID change something? Will it be different what you will be doing? Let's say next year, everybody has vaccinations and things will go back to normal in 22 or late 21. But what is normal? normal? What, what is normal, God? What is normal? <laughs> Are we going back to normal? I highly doubt it. Well, I mean, I mean, normal is gonna have to change. I think it should change because normal- Have you changed? Obviously, has changed. your work changed? Does a limited, do you think something will be different because of this year? Yes, um, there was this aspect of uh, the living that was, um, and I, I used to say this to Judith, that I said, you know, this is very dictatorship sometimes. It's like a <laughs> cult sometimes, you know? Uh, and she was like, well, what if we're a cult? It doesn't matter. You know, she wouldn't deny it. Um, and I feel like what has is different is that, and I think she wants us to evolve, uh, is that it's not really about like what Dennis said about belief, really, but it's about why we do what we do and that why uh can be as simple as just i want to do it my heart wants to do it and uh and uh or you know the, the why of the of the of the particular project like the particular project of beginning middle ending was 
we wanted everyone to res to be connected. We wanted everyone to be connected at this time. So the impulse of why we do what we do has changed, I think. Uh, there's isolation, so there's more need to be uh, connected. There's uh, um, uh, everything that's happening politically has changed as well, you know. I, so uh, we respond to that time, at that time. And I, I know that's very transient and that's not like, even Dennis has been, Dennis is our, our, our guide in a lot of ways, you know, he's, he's our, um, he puts us back in check. And, uh, you know, he, we had a meeting recently that was like, what's our vision, you know, and we all kind of like, uh, you know, shy away because I think it's really about not the vision because it's always changing. It's about why we're doing what we're doing at that time, which is the true meaning of Zen and and I think, um, you know, what's gonna happen next would be, it's actually, it reminds us more how much we wanna do in-person performance, how much we're gonna, we wanna dive more into what it means by participation in a theater production. What is participatory? How much control do we have and how much control should we let go so that something that's totally new can come out from a production itself with the audience members and also how much more in terms of how therapeutic each production should be and how much more power that we should offer people so that they feel liberated when they are coming to work with us. And those things, you know, after this COVID, I believe that we, we all have felt very strongly about these elements, these values that we wanna carry on moving forward, wherever, that the production might be, even if it's just on Zoom or on, on, on social media. Those are the things that we, we, we don't wanna lose. And we, thanks to COVID, we were reminded those core values that we learned from the living theater moving forward. Right. And in terms of logistics, um, the goal is to do more live performances with live audiences. But just like in the film world, <clears throat> there's a COVID officer who is responsible for keeping the production safe. And if that's what we need to do um, and create an audience space six feet apart, actors six feet apart, maybe that's exciting um, out of necessity, you know, coming the, that, the true truth, out of necessity coming the truth, basically. Um, if we need to adjust for that, that is something we'll do. And maybe we'll keep some of the digital formats that we've developed in some way. Um, but the Liminal Archive was designed or, or conceived to grow with us through this time. So it started as writing and became these digital imprints that we post online. And from that, we will take that and form it into a script that could be performed. And perhaps the digital elements could be presented during that live performance. But we want it to, we don't know how, what's gonna happen with it because we're looking towards the future and still developing that. Um, but it will have its rules and its limits and we'll embrace those limits. And content wise, uh, very interestingly, throughout this year, we have been discussing about the issues that we care so much, uh, especially the political issues. It's not between Biden or Trump. It's, there's something that's deeper that, that troubles everybody's daily life, the, the, the incoming equality and all that. And then because we had so much time on the internet, we started to make, connect the dots. What happened in Peru? Why were they on the street fighting? What happened to the yellow vests? Why were they on the street fighting? What happened to India? We start making all those stats and realize there is one big fundamental thing that's troubling everybody in this world. It's beyond Biden or Trump. Those are just symptoms. So we always come back and then check in. What are the things we really wanna, wanna deal with? What's our next production is gonna like? How do we speak on those issues? How do we incorporate as many voices as different voices, not just from you know, the racial diversity within America, but on the global stage, what are the people uh, arguing about? What do they care? How do we make sure that this message is as universal as possible and really go into the very core 
that cause human suffering. I think that's something that we have been discussing and talking about moving forward. There's also an incredible platform, if you want to talk about that, Dennis, that you created um, to unify all of us where we can post images and maybe you want to talk about that platform because I think that's really helpful to other people as well. Oh yeah, it's just a platform that, you know, we're moving to the new technological world. Some platforms that help building a company, uh, a collective like Slack or Trello, those like really new app that actually bring us even closer together because that's the platform that we can throw in ideas at any time. And it's- Do you always- use Slack or Trello? What do you use? We use Trello. Trello, yeah, that's interesting. That's something that's more or less designed for a business context for you know units working together for an advertising project or build a new car that a company takes it and you have it as a model of communication. You, you twist and use something that's existing for something different. Yeah, why not? If there's a tool, uh, the tool should be available for everybody. And especially in America, if we only think of corporates, we can never create a space for artists. And if we utilize all those apps, at the end of the day, if we don't find anything that's satisfactory to us, we can represent our voice as an artist and say like, hey, you need to change. And that's essentially what Union was all about in the very beginning. We Mm. unify people's voice and then demand change. Yeah, and Trello is $5, you know, it's easy access. What about TikTok? Um, TikTok is a world that um, people engage with. We look down to it, but it's becoming a phenomenon. And and now theater artists are going on it, short messages, but people actually listen to it. There's a following. We had a meeting about that. Oh, with Peter. Are you going to use that? Are you going to say, you know, why not? I forgot about Peter. We get a following worldwide. Are Are you working on that? I mean, we, we, we definitely talk, talked about it. We said, if we want to reach to the next generation, we definitely need to incorporate that, that platform, which means, you know, we, we, there's definitely like opposing voices within our group. Like, why do we have to go into TikTok? Because it's, it's, it's such a, like a trendy thing. But what we, we think about is we utilize that very example of the teenagers uh, unifying themselves to book the tickets to Trump rally and didn't show up. That was a social movement. And how are we going to utilize this platform to create something that actually, uh, to create a direct action that disrupts the social order to its extreme? And if, if TikTok is the platform, why not? So that was one of the voices. And the other one, of course, is the concern about the privacy issue, the personal freedom and all that. So we're still ongoing in terms of the debate, but I think uh, a lot of us are very open-minded in terms of like how do we co- incorporate all the tools out there so that our voice can be heard. Amazing, amazing, amazing. We are coming you closer to the, to the end uh, um, of our talk. Um, so this is for our viewers, you know, this is interesting. There's a company that came out of a company that dates back, I think Living Theater was founded 48 or 49 um, and developed methods. You are re- Remoduling them, you're reusing, you're repurposing them um, for the 21st century. I think uh, your small mobile units, you don't have a theater in itself, you don't even have an office, you contract, you can, you, you can as a small mobile unit uh, connect uh, in cities, even in countries where you have people who have collaborated with in Italy, Brazil, Argentina, wherever you would go, and you perform on the streets and the plus in the parks, but also in theater. Um, the, you know, just looking at you guys here, the diversity in your company is outstanding. Everybody talks about it now, but you have done this, you know, for a long time in the living, especially also your company without even thinking about it, you know, that it's now something that's being added on the web page, you know, to, to um, have that diversity statement. This is in itself, it was always an integral part of your work. And so this is um, and quite, uh, quite sophisticated now how you're also going into you know, the digital realm and uh, reusing apps and uh, possibly working with TikTok. Yeah, why not? Your performances in Brazil here or restaging on very short uh, 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 spots that might when people um, uh, inspire to come and see the full performances. So um, it is it is uh, um, um, wonderful to see, you know, how it will be people will be following your work to see you know, what, what solutions you find, what better questions you will have and uh, so stay true to tradition, but also reinvent it. And that's why I think this is an important 
um, adventure you guys are on and everybody listening out here, you know, hire these people. I mean, it's so hard to create something there. Of course, not subsidized, don't have that company structure of a nonprofit that is, you know, being supported like the off and off of Broadway playhouses. You know, Soraya should be in a TV show and a lead actor and put the money back in and Dennis could be directing other work uh, and uh, Jessica does documentaries, Shadow is a dancer. So I think we have to support them and think about it as professionals um, and they are great artists and they're also evolving and developing and now it is of course crucial. At the end of the uh, talk, uh, what, what, what are new projects? Can you share? What are new ideas? What do you have? Are they going to happen or not? What are you guys working on? Well, there's one other space that we're exploring in this new realm and that's internet radio. And uh, because of our, our germination as Alimite, we met a group in Tijuana called NetNet Space that's run by Jaime Jimenez and several other artists in Tijuana. And they have developed a NetNet Radio. And that's a 24 hour broadcast at netnetradio.com. You can just go there and listen to everything that's being played for free. And one of the elements um, that Alimite can contribute to that is live readings, um, talks like this, and other, other you know, digital audio performance experiments. Um, so that's one thing that will start coming out in 2021 uh, is on net net radio um, performances and things from all Ite. And we are also talking a, a possible collaboration with the Freedom Theater from Palestine. We are trying to do something with them. So that's that's that. and that will be digital, like a digital project. Mm -hmm. What was that project that um, Leia was proposing for April? Oh, yeah, it's that Palestine, it's Palestine Freedom Theater. It's Palestine, okay. mm. Any plays are you doing or productions? We're discussing devising a new piece in the same manner that we did devise Electric Awakening. Mm. Are you familiar with how we put that piece together? Well, maybe you can see it in a few sentences. But, uh, yeah. I think Dennis can do that better than me. <laughs> It's, we, we had a concept and we want to play along uh, mysteries and smaller pieces to just do a lot of physical work without language to convey a very idea, which means to confront the unknown. So we have, we create a life cycle in different stages and we talk about each stage, what are we trying to confront? And we, we simply just do physical exercises inspired by all the smaller physical exercises that we did in the living theater develop further into a performance. Right, amazing, yeah. And I'm sure you can do great workshops at universities, teach about the history of the living, uh, the legacy of it. And again, it's a, it is, a, a, I think, um, a, a way to do theater, a method that does work outside on the streets, in the parks, in the public spaces, engage with social, political context, environmental themes as these guys, it was the pipeline or in front of the detention centers. Um, a diverse group, um, you know, that uh, that really reflects how New York City looks like, and um, and to work together collectively. They say the big change, perhaps, is you know that it's done as a collective. More people are responsible to it, and will take artistic credit instead of the one person who might have done this um, um, before. I think uh, what um, um, also what Shadow said, the idea: how do we bring people in to our specters, how do we get close to them? Or earlier on, I think Soraya said, you know, we listen, what does the community need? What can we do? And Dennis's idea, you know, of, uh, um, of, of creating uh, sensible spaces, you know, where people, even if they turn their head or listen for a moment, you know, and most people, of course, are sort of think we'll have a deeper effort, but there is something in there that this company has done for a very long time that in the time of COVID works, but perhaps it's also of significance whether there is a virus out there or not. It's a great form of theater. It's an important one that emerged and that is moving, that is growing, but also changing its shape. And it's something we um, we all uh, should and can follow. And also it's honoring the legacy of a great, great theater company that like very few others. And some claim it has been the most significant theater company of the 20th century, the living was the biggest impact, biggest success, and it changed uh, how we think about theater. So um, congratulations, you guys, of a, 
putting this uh, out there, the work of connecting, creating your own community, but a community beyond it. And uh, I really wish you um, all the best. And, um, and, uh, and I hope that you also can be in the legacy, maybe able also to teach it and, 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 and continue that work with the living of theaters, but also through your company. I just want to say one thing that uh, I think that the strength of this company that is done and what we're open to is that I want to encourage people to not have any fear, no fear in this time. Uh, I think there's a lot of fear and that creates a lot of more disease and more issues and more isolation. And so we are a platform that if you have an idea or if there's anything that uh, you need uh, that we would love to like help in whatever we can with the tools that we have to help um, overcome that with, an, in, and I think that what attracts people to the living theater and to us is that it's a nonviolent form mm -hmm. of, um, of invitation and of uh, doing things as well. Yeah, and Soraya is a healer also by profession, a highly, highly trained one actually. So, and anyone, I guess, then go to the website of Alimite, send them your projects, reach out to them, learn from them or be part of it or do your own company. I'm sure they will listen to you and give you advice or come and visit. Um, this is also something we can do now. So thank you all for listening. Thanks for HowlRound. It's great that we had BJ with us. Tomorrow we hear from the great New Yorkian Poetry Cafe from spoken word artists, uh, a group of people around that is a really significant and groundbreaking institution that has uh, um, provided New York City also with uh, such significant work in the arts that it is really worth to to hear from them um, tomorrow as a closure of the um, of the 2020 Siegel talk. So thank you guys for taking the time. I hope um, it was as inspiring to you as it was to us. Thank you for our listeners. Um, we know how much is out there, how many content it's and are more and more talks. We started very early on in March. Where I think the only one, we are the only theater institution doing, doing daily programming from Monday through Friday, creating new content. Actually, we are the only one, I think, uh, perhaps even in Europe. Um, and, um, and so it's, I think it has been a contribution. We are very proud of it. And, um, and it was a, a, for us also a way to survive and to be uh, connected to people and share the suffering and sorrows, but also the beauty and the mysterious uh, way art works. And we talked to so many artists and, uh, and I think it was um, a, a great uh, contribution. They gave us the artists and listening to them and their voices. But thanks to the audience that listened to us, stayed with us. I hope um, that uh, you will come back to us next year. We are also thinking, how will we go on? We don't know yet, we are thinking about it. And, uh, and um, so um, happy new year and we hope that 20, one will be better than 2020, a quarter year. And uh, the election with Trump, uh, with COVID, uh, the Black Lives Matter, it's certainly a year that for decades will resonate through it. And um, we are part of it, we are part of it, but we also as, um, as Arise, that we are acting in that, we are actors, we have to be part of the change we want to see, we have to take action. It's about us, not about other people, we have to do that, Alimite also, makes that clear that what this is about is not that they are great artists, but they want to inspire people to change forms that are not working and to find new ones or save forms that are good that we should keep. But um, we have to uh, find uh, ways to create the meaning and understand the times we live in and art has been uh, an, a great, great, great contribution towards that. So thank you all for taking your time. And, um, and uh, all the best with your work. We'll keep following what you are doing. So uh, um, uh, all our congratulations of taking on that big shadow, that big, big theater that's over you, the names of Judas and Julian about to go forward. But in a way, this is also what mankind does. We have our history behind us. This is this angel of Walter Benjamin, you know, who has the catastrophe in the back. But it's looking forward, but it's you know a mountain of, of a rubble is and then we have to see what the new times brings, but it's also part of, of, of the rebirth and the change that happens and it's part of life. So thank you all and uh, see you next week, hear you next week, and I hope you will all come back next. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.